Just a potato head. Back doors are not secrets. What's a back door? Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to talk about something rather controversial. The question of whether there are or ever have been backdoors into Microsoft Windows. Can a rogue tap into Windows systems at will? With literally thousands of engineers having had access to the source code over the years and countless more hackers trying to get access to it every day, what hidden secrets might it hold by now? I was one of the developers on every Microsoft operating system from MS-DOS through XP and Server 2003, and from the research I've done in the last few weeks for this episode, most of what you've heard about backdoors and Windows, and indeed how Windows itself was actually developed, is largely untrue. I've been retired for quite some time now, however, and when I left, they were still using Slime and Source Depot. Things have no doubt changed and evolved with modern security and the move to Git, but if it were in there then, it's probably still in there now. So the first thing I should do is define what I mean by a backdoor. I'm primarily talking about a private, unauthorized way to escalate to admin rights without credentials, giving whoever knows the secret complete access to any PC that has that backdoor. Well, you'll never get in through the frontline security, but you might look for a backdoor. Yeah, but Jimmy, you're giving away all our best tricks. Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head, backdoors are not secrets. What's a backdoor? Well, whenever I design a system, I always put in a, a simple password that only I know about. That way, whenever I, I want to get back in, I can bypass whatever security they've added on. That's basically what it is. Imagine that an attacker inserted code into Windows so that pressing an obscure sequence of keys escalated the current program to administrative rights. Assuming the exploit escaped detection and survived until the product was released, and that's a pretty big assumption, that attacker could then walk up to any computer running that version of Windows, enter the key sequence, take over the machine, and do whatever they wanted. And they could do that with any machine. There's not much that a backdoor can accomplish that a zero-day escalation exploit couldn't, except that it would be ubiquitous to all copies of the product, not just present on infected machines only. Given administrative rights on a machine combined with physical access to it, that machine is completely naked to the world unless the data is highly encrypted, since even admins cannot decrypt your data without the key. Or can they? That brings us to the second kind of backdoor that we'll consider separately. The ability for a third party, be it Microsoft themselves, a rogue, or the NSA, to read your privately encrypted secure data on a Windows machine using an unauthorized secret key. Now, I don't mean that the NSA brute forces your key using some secret mega computer. That's a topic for a different day. I mean the notion that the NSA provided a secret private key to be inserted into Windows that allows them to read users' data at will. The NSA key episode is coming up soon, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss it. Microsoft has always needed to guard not only against internal rogues, but also determined even nation-state hackers. We've already seen how China infiltrated the Microsoft Exchange Group, so attacking Windows itself is simply a few buildings over. If a Russian or Chinese attacker wished to accomplish these ends, he or she would need to breach security far enough to access the source code and circumvent the various safeguards, some of which I'll talk about shortly. As a related example, source code leaks always tended to make me furious, so I was always daydreaming about ways to, if not prevent them, at least make them traceable somehow. The solution I thought up was to watermark the source code with unique white space when checked out of the source code servers. Imagine that your username was hashed to some unique number and that its bits were encoded in seemingly random lines of the source code by the presence or absence of additional white space at the end of certain lines. An extra space somewhere in the line means a 1, its absence could mean a 0. For any file of non-trivial size, there's plenty of room to encode the unique ID of the person who made the initial checkout. Or perhaps, since it's Windows, you could do it by varying the line endings between carriage return alone and those with a line feed. Or, since our code could contain tabs back then, you could selectively convert some tabs to spaces. All of these would be hard to detect visually or by looking at the files in a text editor. And better yet, if you checked the file out to two different users and then diffed the files, at least with our internal tool known as WinDiff, it would, by default, ignore whitespace and still show the files as identical. Or you could even modify WinDiff to ignore your changes if you want to be extra clever. My hunch is that our code probably was watermarked, and here's why. There was absolutely no mention of such a thing. I later realized that tracing a source code leak might be good for vengeance, but it ultimately doesn't do anything to unring that bell. But making it publicly known that the code is traceable somehow might discourage people from considering being the source of a leak in the first place. And so the value is actually in people thinking the source code is traceable, whether it is or not. It may be even more valuable to announce the fact and then not watermark the code, or to watermark it with a superfluous red herring of some kind in addition to your real mark, than to actually do the work. It's the same reason that they told you the water would turn purple if you peed in the pool when you were little. 
It was never actually true, but it stopped a lot of you from shamefully polluting our public pools. Sorry if this is coming to you as news just now. Believing the code is watermarked would likely dissuade at least the non-technical people that had access to the code. You don't want your desktop turning purple, after all. In reading what the press and the public thinks on the topic, one notion came up again and again. The belief that one of the primary arguments against the notion of backdoors existing is that access to the Windows source code at Microsoft is tightly controlled and highly compartmentalized, such that developers have access only to the parts of the code they need in order to do their job. Now, this makes it harder to sneak a backdoor in. While there are numerous policies and procedures that I'll cover shortly to prevent backdoors from being inserted, compartmentalized access was not really one of them, at least not in my day. How do I know? Because I used to regularly build all of Windows on my dev machine. That meant I had to enlist in the entire source tree, and then, normally, before I left at night or for the weekend, I would run a script called Time Build. That script would do the necessary magic of launching our build process in just the right way, and then bin placing all the binaries, splitting the symbols off, and all the other various and sundry tasks that are necessary to go from a big old source tree to a nice flat CD with a running setup program on it. When I came back the next morning, if all had gone well, I'd have a folder in the root of my drive named something like x86 check which would signify that this was a checked build, meaning it was built with debug defined in the full symbols, and was intended to run on the Intel chips. It was my own completely custom build from which I could run setup and install. In my earlier days, our source code management system was called Slime for Source Library Manager. In my later years, we transitioned to a tool called Source Depot, and after I left, I believe they moved to Git. But as long as I was there, I had complete access to the entire tree. And as far as I recall, so did all the developers on the team. When I was working on Olay, I also had access to the Office source code so that I could debug cross-application object scenarios. I had access to the code for MS-DOS, Windows, Office, Visual Studio, and probably a lot of other products I never even thought about. That said, most developers did not enlist in the world, as we called it, with the world being the entire tree of Windows with 50 million or so lines of code. That was generally reserved for the few of us with multiprocessor hardware that could get it accomplished overnight. I only did it because I wanted a MIPS build with the symbols needed to run the Visual Studio debugger, and our official build lab produced only cough symbols intended for our command line debugger, NTSD. I took on the task of building the entire source tree just so that I could have symbols in my own chosen format, but it wasn't something that others normally did. The point is though, they could have if they wanted to. Normally though, if you worked on the shell team for example, you might only enlist in the shell project. It's a subtree right off the NT root, and when you build it, you get the desktop and explorer and task manager and zip folders and calculator and all of the UI based components. You copy those binaries over top of your System32 originals and debug away. But you're not normally building the kernel because you obtained those binaries pre made by the people in the build lab who put them up on a server for your use. The takeaway then is that even though everyone didn't need the entire source code, everyone on the team had full rewrite access to it. In summary then, source code compartmentalization was not a meaningful defense back in my day. To complicate matters further, all you really needed to check code into the NT source tree was a set of credentials that belonged to the NT dev domain. And guess what else has NT dev credentials? Well, I think the print servers and certainly the build machines in the build lab had accounts that were fairly widely known. They usually had the names of ski resorts as a password and they never changed. My recollection was that the logins for the NT dev domain were pretty easy to get a hold of and that you could, at least in theory, check code in from the print server in the copy room. Again, never tried it, don't quote me, but it looked plausible. Of course, the odds were that someone would notice that a headless server had just checked code into the heap manager, for example. If you were checking code into calculator, the local team members would be notified of the change and people on that team would normally scrutinize your code to see what it was you had done to their precious calculator. And the deeper you went in the system, the greater the scrutiny. If you really did check code into the heap manager, it didn't matter who did it, Steve Wood would review your code in great detail. Even if you had a very good reason to be doing so and did it from your own machine, the chance was that Mark Lukowski and Dave Cutler and any other number of kernel people would wonder, what the hell is this guy doing checking code into the heap manager? And they would review your code as well. And if your code wasn't completely golden in every way, Dave C would walk through your wall to discuss it with you. That's one reason I don't put much faith in open source as protection. When it comes to malicious code that is, we can assume, trying to hide itself, it's not really about how many eyeballs review the code, it's about which eyeballs. If you check a change into a deep part of the kernel that Linus himself still feels ownership for, then just like Dave Seawood, he's going to review your change. And for any other number of Linux components, there is, we hope, a local domain expert that will wonder what it is you're doing. So if you check a change into the ext4 file system, I hope a lot of people look at it just as closely as if you were partying on NTFS. The thing is, there's no real guarantee. 
Just because anyone in the world can clone and inspect a Linux source code tree doesn't mean that A, they're always qualified to notice and find exploits, and B, that someone who's an expert will review each and every change. If you do wish to be fully secure, then the Linux that you're running probably isn't the solution. Ubuntu, for example, is not fully open source. In fact, almost all the Linux distros are not fully open source. They contain binary blobs for things like chipsets on network adapters. So let's say that you have a driver for a card and it sports an ESP32 silicon package. Is the firmware included as a binary from the vendor or is it built from C source code that you can see and read? Because then they'd have to include the entire ESP32 dev system for one thing. And so for most Linux distros, the answer is that there are binary blobs for which you do not get the source. And being fully open source is like being pregnant. You can't be a little bit pregnant. And when it comes to security, you can't be a little bit fully open source. Either you are or you aren't. And the Linux used by 99% of its most ardent fans is not fully open source meaning neither they nor I have any full idea what's included in it any more than we do with Windows. Now to be sure, there are fully open source distributions like Tragora, Trisuel, and Gwix. In other words, not the one you're probably using to type up your angry comment on right now if you're using one of the more common distributions. Now, all that aside, who's actually checking code into the kernel? Even I didn't hack on the kernel very often. One time, to serve a need I had for Windows XP's product activation, I was implementing read-only register keys, something that Windows normally had no notion of. To accomplish it required some changes deep down in the kernel's early boot process. I figured out how and where to make the changes and so went ahead and did so, got my code review and checked it in and so on. And about three minutes after the change went in, my phone rang. It was someone on the kernel team demanding to know what the hell I was doing and who had approved and reviewed my changes. Which brings me to the next layer of defense, the build lab. For any change in the source code, the build lab itself would not even pick up your change for inclusion in the tree unless you specifically sent email to both NT-Build and NT-Dev with not only a description of your changes, but also a detailed script that would sync and build those changes. Anyone on the team should be able to take your email and copy and paste it into a console window and get your changes exactly as you intended them. And two things added security here. The build lab would review what you said you changed against what you actually did when your changes were adopted. If you said you were checking code into the calculator, but instead added some new lines to the kernel, you can be sure that the build lab would notice. And so would people on both the kernel team and the shell teams. They would run your script and see, hey, this joker said he was changing calculator, but I need to be enlisted in the heap manager to even pick up his code. It's not that everyone is watching everything. It's that someone, a domain expert, owns and is watching every component. It's that principle of ownership that breeds responsibility. It certainly exists for some Linux components with specific owners, but open source can also breed a lot of the attitude of, well, other people will see this, so someone else will catch it. The next layer was the code review. The code review was our process whereby each and every line of a check-in was personally reviewed and checked by another senior developer, typically a peer or, as I said, someone senior to you in the dev org. You would sit down with that person, the WinDiff tool and your check-in script, and the reviewer would look at each and every line of your change from the source control server. Deleted lines were in bright red, new lines were in bright yellow, and your check-in script, when sent to the build lab and anti-dev, had to include the name of your code reviewer and include them on the CC line so you could see that you had claimed that they were your reviewer. Assuming diligence on the part of the code reviewer, it would be hard to sneak anything significant past a good code review. Suffice to say that every line that enters the source tree is reviewed by someone knowledgeable about the area where the change is being made, ideally multiple people. And yet, I know it happened at least once, but was caught because it happened once in my own office. Back in 1993, I was an intern on the MS-DOS team, working over the summer to add CD-ROM caching to smart drive, make disk copy single pass, and stuff the entire setup program onto a single floppy using deltas and so on. When I was done at the end of the summer, I went home to finish my last semester of classes. And that's when I received a phone call from Ben, who had been my boss in DOS over the summer. He wanted to know what I knew and when I knew it about a supposed backdoor of sorts that had been inserted into the MS-DOS copy command. I was flabbergasted as I genuinely had no idea what he was talking about. In short order, he revealed some of the essential details. There had been a backdoor of sorts inserted into MS-DOS. In fact, it was directly inserted into command.com itself. If you remember how MS-DOS worked, many commands like the copy command were built directly into the command.com interpreter. And the intern who I shared an office with over the summer had committed the ultimate sin. He had circumvented all of the official procedures, but the change was caught anyway by another step that I won't tell you because it was actually effective then and it might still be effective now. But it was likely because a manual review was performed on all of the code changes contributed to MS-DOS by interns that summer, or something like that. Fortunately, it was non-destructive. Of course, there is no security to circumvent an MS-DOS after all, so whether it's a backdoor is up to debate, but it was also very hard to trigger. If you used the copy command and provided a special argument, it would print I heart sex over and over and over until you pressed Control-C, I think. 
pretty juvenile to say the least. To trigger it, the author had required that you supply a special command line argument, a slash followed by an ASCII code that was way up high in the character set. You could only enter it by using the ALT key in the numeric keypad to generate the right ASCII code, so no one would have stumbled across it by accident. Suffice to say, the intern in question was not invited back for a full-time position. There are many layers of defense, some automated and some manual, but it all begins with ensuring that someone, a human with a vested interest and expertise in the area, reviews each and every line of change that enters the source code tree. And code that runs in an administrative or kernel or device context must be scrutinized much more closely than code intended for higher level functionality. This is true no matter whether it's closed source or open source. It's the expertise of the review, not how broadly that code is available, that determines whether such a malicious payload will be caught before release. And I can only assume that things have come a long way in the 20 years that I've been retired now. Suffice to say, there's never been a backdoor discovered in a shipping version of Windows, and the further we get away from the operating system's humble roots in a comparatively tiny team, the less likely it becomes that someone will sneak one past the goalie, as the saying goes. They take security very seriously these days. Well, that would be a great point to segue over and talk about the NSA key and encryption backdoors, where some people have some pretty strongly held opinions, but are they based in fact or legend? We're running out of time, so you have to wait for that episode coming up soon on this channel. If along the way you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, or if you'd like to see the NSA key episode, I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving it a like and subscribing to my channel. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. Now, it's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.